Good morning, world. Random live stream. If you happen to be woke, thanks for tuning in. If you catch this later, I hope you enjoy. This is one of my favorite books. Uh, I feel like everyone speaks of their ancestors or of the past, but no one really listens to them. So we're going to check out an audio book from some great wise gentlemen. If you like what you hear, share this thing far and wide. One of the Negro problem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Negro Problem. Section 1. Industrial Education for the Negro. By Booker T. Washington. Principal of Tuskegee Institute. The necessity for the races learning the difference between being worked and working. He would not confine the Negro to industrial life, but believes that the very best service which anyone can render to what is called the higher education is to teach the present generation to work and save. This will create the wealth from which alone can come leisure and the opportunity for higher education. 1908. <laughs> One of the most fundamental and far-reaching deeds that has been accomplished during the last quarter of a century has been that by which the Negro has been helped to find himself and to learn the secrets of civilization. To learn that there are a few simple cardinal principles upon which a race must start its upward course, unless it would fail, and its last estate be worse than its first. Mm -mm -mm. It has been necessary for the Negro to learn the difference between being worked and working. To learn that being worked meant degradation, while working means civilization that all forms of labor are honorable, and all forms of idleness disgraceful. All forms of honor. It has been necessary for him to learn that all races that have got upon their feet have done so largely by laying an economic foundation, and in general by beginning in a proper cultivation and ownership of the soil. Forty years ago, my race emerged from slavery into freedom. If, in too many cases, the Negro race began development at the wrong end, it was largely because neither white nor black properly understood the case. Nor is it any wonder that this was so. For never before in the history of the world had just such a problem been presented as that of the two races at the coming of freedom in this country. For 250 years, I believe the way for the redemption of the Negro was being prepared through industrial development. Through all those years, the southern white man did business with the Negro in a way that no one else has done business with him. In most cases, if a southern white man wanted a house built, he consulted a Negro mechanic about the plan and about the actual building of the structure. If he wanted a suit of clothes made, he went to a Negro tailor. And for <laughs> shoes, he went to a shoemaker of the same race. In a certain way, every slave plantation in the South was an industrial school. On these plantations, young colored men and women were constantly being trained not only as farmers, but as carpenters, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, brick masons, engineers, cooks, laundresses, sewing women, and housekeepers. Trade. I do not mean in any way to apologize for the curse of slavery, which was a curse to both races. Slavery was a curse to both races. That's something that we need to get out to the world, because it's not like the masses of white America benefited from it. There's a few individuals, but you also could say there's a few black individuals that have benefited from it as well and are still currently today benefited from it as well. But in what I say about industrial training and slavery, I'm simply stating facts. This training was crude and was given for selfish purposes. It did not answer the highest ends because there was an absence of mental training in connection with the training of the hand. To a large degree, though, this business contact with the southern white man and the industrial training on the plantations left the Negro at the close of the war in possession of nearly all the common and skilled labor in the South. The industries that gave the South its power, prominence, and wealth prior to the Civil War were mainly the raising of cotton, sugar cane, rice, and tobacco. Before the way could be prepared for the proper growing and marketing of these crops, Forests had to be cleared, houses to be built, public roads and railroads constructed. In all these works, the Negro did most of the heavy work. 
in the planting hispanics do all those jobs now cultivating and marketing of the crops not only was the negro the chief dependence but in the manufacture of tobacco he became a skilled and proficient workman and in this up to the present time in the south holds the lead in the large tobacco manufactories in most of the industries though what happened for nearly twenty years after the war except in a few instances the value of the industrial training given by the plantations was overlooked negro men and women were educated in literature in mathematics and in the sciences with little thought of what had been taking place during the preceding two hundred and fifty years except perhaps as something to be escaped to be got as far away from as possible as a generation began to pass those who had been trained as mechanics in slavery began to disappear by death and gradually it began to be realized that there were few to take their places there were young men educated in foreign tongues but few in carpentry or in mechanical or architectural drawing many were trained in latin but few as engineers and blacksmiths too many were taken from the farm and educated but educated in everything but farming for this reason they had no interest in farming and did not return to it and yet eighty five per cent of the negro population of the southern states lives and for a considerable time will continue to live in the country districts the charge is often brought against the members now. of my race and too often justly i confess that they are found leaving the country districts and flocking into the great cities where <laughs> temptations are more frequent and harder to resist like you know the and where the negro people too often become demoralized think though how frequently it is the case that from the first day that a pupil begins to go to school his books teach him much about the cities of the world and city life and almost nothing about the country how natural it is then that when he has the ordering of his life he wants to live it in the city only a short time before his death the late mr c p huntington to whose memory a magnificent library has just been given by his widow to the hampton institute for negroes in virginia said in a public address some words which seem to me so wise that i want to quote them here Check this our out. schools teach everybody a little of almost everything but in my opinion they teach very few children just what they ought to know in order to make their way successfully in life they do not put into their hands the tools they are best fitted to use and hence so many failures many a mother and sister have worked and slaved living upon scanty food in order to give a son and brother a liberal education and in doing this have built up a barrier between the boy and the work he was fitted to do let me say to you that all honest work is honorable work if the labor is manual and seems common you will have all the more chance to be thinking of other things or of work that is higher and brings better pay and to work out in your minds better and higher duties and responsibilities for yourselves and for thinking of ways by which you can help others as well as yourselves and bring them up to your own higher level some years ago when we decided to make tailoring a part of our training at the tuskegee institute i was amazed to find that it was almost impossible to find in the whole country an educated colored man who could teach the making of clothing we could find numbers of them who could teach astronomy theology latin or grammar but almost none who could instruct in the making of clothing something that has to be used by every one of us every day in the year how often have i been discouraged as i have gone through the south and into the homes of the people of my race and have found women who could converse intelligently upon abstruse subjects and yet could not tell how to improve the condition of the poorly cooked and still more poorly served bread and meat which they and their families were eating three times a day it is discouraging to find a girl who can tell you the geographical location of any country on the globe and who does not know where to place the dishes upon a common dinner table it is discouraging to find a woman who knows much about theoretical chemistry and who cannot properly wash and iron a shirt imagine if these same things were said in 2022 yeah i was wondering was there any comments you know how youtube is in what i say here i would not by any means have it understood that i would limit or circumscribe the mental development of the negro student no race can be lifted until its mind is awakened and strengthened 
by the side of industrial training should always go mental and moral training but the pushing of mere abstract knowledge into the head means little we want more than the mere performance of mental gymnastics our knowledge must be harnessed to the things of real life i would encourage the negro to secure all the mental strength all the mental culture whether gleaned from science mathematics history language or literature that his circumstances will allow but i believe most earnestly that for years to come the education of the people of my race should be so directed that the greatest proportion of the mental strength of the masses will be brought to bear upon the everyday practical things of life upon something that is needed to be done and something which they will be permitted to do in the community in which they reside and just the same with the professional class which the race needs and must have i would say give the men and women of that class too the training which will best fit them to perform in the most successful manner the service which the race demands i would not confine the race to industrial life not even to agriculture for example although i believe that by far the greater part of the negro race is best off in the country districts and must and should continue to live there but i would teach the race that in industry the foundation must be laid that the very best service which anyone can render to what is called the higher education is to teach the present generation to provide a material or industrial foundation yes on such a foundation as this will grow habits of thrift a love of work economy ownership of property bank accounts out of it in the future hey, these comments ain't even just for for black kids no more this is for every kid in america because all these kids are lazy don't want to work and super entitled <laughs> it will grow practical education professional education positions of public responsibility out of it will grow moral and religious strength out of it will grow wealth from which alone can come leisure and the opportunity for the enjoyment of literature and the fine arts in the words of the late beloved Frederick Douglass, every blow of the sledgehammer wielded by a sable arm is a powerful blow in support of our cause. Every colored mechanic is by virtue of circumstances an elevator of his race. Every house built by a black man is a strong tower against the allied hosts of prejudice. It is impossible for us to attach too much importance to this aspect of the subject. Without industrial development, there can be no wealth. Without wealth, there can be no leisure. Without leisure, no opportunity for thoughtful reflection and the cultivation of the higher arts. I would set no limits to the attainments of the Negro in arts, in letters, or statesmanship. But I believe the surest way to reach those ends is by laying the foundation in the little things of life that lie immediately about one's door. I plead for industrial education and development for the Negro, not because I want to cramp him, but because I want to free him. I want to see him enter the all-powerful business and commercial world. It was such combined mental, moral, and industrial education which the late General Armstrong set out to give at the Hampton Institute when he established that school 30 years ago. The Hampton Institute has continued along the lines laid down by its great founder, and now, each year, an increasing number of similar schools are being established in the South. For the people of both races early in the history of the tuskegee institute we began to combine industrial training with mental and isn't it unique how this book was published in 1908 and everything this man is saying is about both races working together for common cause and here we are over a hundred years later and it's all division and divisiveness moral culture our first efforts were in the direction of agriculture and we began teaching this with no appliances except one hoe and a blind mule. From this small beginning we have grown until now, the Institute owns 2,000 acres of land, 800 of which are cultivated each year by the young men of the school. We began teaching wheel riding and blacksmithing in a small way to the men, and laundry work, cooking and sewing, and housekeeping to the young women. The 1,400 and over young men and women who attended the school during the last school year received instruction, in addition to academic and religious training, in 33 trades and industries, including carpentry, blacksmithing, printing, wheel riding, harness making, painting, machinery, founding, shoemaking, 
brick masonry and brick making, plastering, sawmilling, tinsmithing, tailoring, mechanical and architectural drawing, electrical and steam engineering, canning, sewing, dressmaking, millinery, cooking, laundering, housekeeping, mattress making, basketry, nursing, agriculture, Sheesh. dairying and stock raising, horticulture. Not only do the students receive in and now all kids are learning at school is how to question their gender and their sexuality and to make TikTok videos, man, holy moly. Instruction in these trades, but they do actual work, Bring trades by means back. of which more than half of them pay some part or all of their expenses while remaining at the school. Of the 60 buildings belonging to the school, all but four were almost wholly erected by the students as part of their industrial education. Wow. Even the bricks which go into the walls are made by students in the school's brickyard, in which last year they manufactured two million bricks. When we first began this work at Tuskegee, and the idea got spread among the people of my race that the students who came to the Tuskegee school were to be taught industries in connection with their academic studies, were, in other words, to be taught to work, I received a great many verbal messages and letters from parents informing me that they wanted their children taught books, but not how to work. This protest went on for three or four years, but I am glad to be able to say now that our people have very generally been educated to a point where they see their own needs and conditions so clearly that it has been several years since we have had a single protest from parents against the teaching of industries, oh, how that is and there is now a positive enthusiasm for it. In fact, Public sentiment among the students at Tuskegee is now so strong for industrial training that it would hardly permit a student to remain on the grounds who was unwilling to labor. It seems to me that too often mere book education leaves the Negro young man or woman in a weak position. For example, I have seen a Negro girl taught by her mother to help her in doing laundry work at home. Later, when this same girl was graduated from the public schools or a high school and returned home, she finds herself educated out of sympathy with laundry work, and yet not able to find anything to do which seems in keeping with the cost and character of her education. Under these circumstances, we cannot be surprised if she does not fulfill the expectations made for her. What should have been done for her, it seems to me, was to give her, along with her academic education, thorough training in the latest and best methods of laundry work, so that she could have put so much skill and intelligence into it that the work would have been lifted out of the plane of drudgery. The home which she would then have been able to found by the results of her work would have enabled her to help her children to take a still more responsible position in life. Almost from the first, Tuskegee has kept in mind, and this I think should be the policy of all industrial schools, fitting students for occupations which would be open to them in their home communities. Some years ago, we noted the fact that there was beginning to be a demand in the South for men to operate dairies in a skillful, modern manner. We opened a dairy department in connection with the school where a number of young men could have instruction in the latest and most scientific methods of dairy work. At present, we have calls, mainly from Southern white men, for twice as many dairymen as we are able to supply. What is equally satisfactory, the reports which come to us indicate that our young men are giving the highest satisfaction and Man. are fast changing and improving the dairy product in the communities into which they go. I use the dairy here as an example. What I have said of this is equally true of many of the other industries which we teach. Aside from the economic value of this work, I cannot but believe, and my observation confirms me in my belief, that as we continue to place Negro men and women of intelligence, religion, modesty, conscience, and skill in every community in the South, who will prove by actual results their value to the community, I cannot but believe, I say, that this will constitute a solution to many of the present political and social difficulties. Many seem to think that industrial education is meant to make the Negro work as he worked in the days of slavery. This is far from my conception of industrial education. If this training is worth anything to the Negro, it consists in teaching him how not to work, but how to make the forces of nature, air, steam, water, horsepower, and electricity, work for him. If it has any value, it is in lifting labor up out of toil and drudgery into the plane of the dignified and the beautiful. 
The Negro in the South works and works hard, but too often his ignorance and lack of skill causes him to do his work in the most costly and shiftless manner, and this keeps him near the bottom of the ladder in the economic world. I have not emphasized particularly in these pages the great need of training the Negro in agriculture, but I believe that this branch of industrial education does need very great emphasis. In this connection, I want to quote some words which Mr. Edgar Gardner Murphy of Montgomery, Alabama, has recently written upon this subject. We must incorporate into our public school system a larger recognition of the practical and industrial elements in educational training. <laughs> Ours is an agricultural population. How far schools have went. The school must be brought more closely to the soil. The teaching of history, for example, is all very well, but nobody can really know anything of history unless he has been taught to see things grow, has so seen things not only with the outward eye, but with the eyes of his intelligence and conscience. The actual things of the present are more important, however, than the institutions of the past. Even to young children can be shown the simpler conditions and processes of growth, how corn is put into the ground, how cotton and potatoes should be planted, how to choose the soil best adapted to a particular plant, how to improve that soil, how to care for the plant while it grows, how to get the most value out of it, how to use the elements of waste for the fertilization of other crops, how, through the alternation of crops, the land may be made to increase the annual value of its products. These things, upon their elementary side, are absolutely vital to the worth and success of hundreds of thousands of these people of the Negro race, and yet our whole educational system has practically ignored them. Such work will mean not only an education in agriculture, but an education through agriculture and education, through natural symbols and practical forms, which will educate as deeply, as broadly, and as truly as any other system which the world has known. Such changes will bring far larger results than the mere improvement of our Negroes. They will give us an agricultural class, a class of tenants or small landowners trained not away from the soil, but in relation to the soil, and an intelligent dependence upon its resources. I close, then, as I began, by saying that as a slave the Negro was worked, and that as a freeman he must learn to work. Do for so. There was still doubt in many quarters as to the ability of the Negro, unguided, unsupported, to hew his own path, and to put into visible, tangible, indisputable form, products and signs of civilization. This doubt cannot be much affected by abstract arguments, no matter how delicately and convincingly woven together. Patiently, quietly, doggedly, persistently, through summer and winter, sunshine and shadow, by self-sacrifice, by foresight, by honesty and industry, we must reinforce argument with results. One farm bought, one house built, one home sweetly and intelligently kept. One man who is the largest taxpayer or has the largest bank account. One school or church maintained. One factory running successfully. One truck garden profitably cultivated. One patient cured by a Negro doctor. One sermon well preached. One office well filled. One life cleanly lived. These will tell more in our favor than all the abstract eloquence that can be summoned to plead our cause. I mean, I, I agree with that 100%. This concept of uh, we need representation. No, all you need is, is one. If one, one person can do it, everyone can do it. A quote that I really like is from Wallace D. Waddles, and he said, the best way to help the poor is to prove to them that you can be rich. And how do you prove to poor people that you can get rich? By becoming rich yourself. And... That's where we are in society. Everything Booker T. Washington said, it can be removed from the Negro problem to the American problem. Because all Americans are super dependent on the government and want somebody to take care of them. And in order to advance in this life, you have to be willing to do the work. You got to get your hands dirty. You got to lose sleep. You, you have to be willing to sacrifice the life you have now for the life you currently want. And if you're not willing to make that choice, then you can't blame no one but yourself. And up next is Booker, uh, not Booker T. Washington, I'm sorry, W.E.B. Du Bois. And him and Booker T. Washington had totally different political ideologies. They looked at life from a totally different perspective. 
Booker T. Washington was actually a slave. W.E.B. Du Bois was born a free man in the North and actually gradu graduated from Harvard. Our pathway must be up through the soil, up through swamps, up through forests, up through the streams, the rocks, up through commerce, education, and religion. End of section one. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. So much knowledge in section one. Just wait. Let this book keep unfolding. So shame that information section like this two is getting from the masses. Of the Negro problem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Negro Problem. Section 2. The Talented Tenth. By Professor W. E. Burkhart Du Bois. A strong plea for the higher education of the Negro, which those who are interested in the future of the freedom cannot afford to ignore. Professor Du Bois produces ample evidence to prove conclusively the truth of his statement that to attempt to establish any sort of a system of common and industrial school training without first providing for the higher training of the very best teachers is simply throwing your money to the winds. The Negro race, like all races, is going to be saved by its exceptional men. The problem of education, then, among Negroes, must first of all deal with the talented tenth. It is the problem of developing the best of this race that they may guide the mass away from the contamination and death of the worst in their own and other races. Now, the training of men is a difficult and intricate task. Its technique is a matter for educational experts, but its object is for the vision of seers. If we make money the object of man training, we shall develop money makers, but not necessarily men. If we make technical skill the object of education, we may possess artisans, but not, in nature, men. Men we shall have only as we make manhood the object of the work of the schools, intelligence, broad sympathy, knowledge of the world that was and is, and of the relation of men to it. This is the curriculum of that higher education which must underlie true life. On this foundation we may build breadwinning, skill of hand and quickness of brain, with never a fear lest the child and man mistake the means of living for the object of life. If this be true, and who can deny it, three tasks lay before me. First, to show from the past that the talented tenth as they have risen among American Negroes have been worthy of leadership. Secondly, to show how these men may be educated and developed. And thirdly, to show their relation to the Negro problem. I think the talented tenth idea started with a good concept, but it's why all... Oh, athletes and entertainers have been hijacked in silence because they're the ones at the top and they control the masses so if you can shut them up you shut everybody up you misjudge us because you do not know us from the very first it has been the educated and intelligent of the negro people that have led and elevated the mass and the sole obstacles that nullified and retarded their efforts were slavery and race prejudice for what is slavery but the legalized survival of the unfit and the nullification of the work of natural internal leadership. Negro leadership, therefore, sought from the first to That's rid the race of this awful incubus that it might make way for natural selection and the survival of the fittest. In colonial days came Phyllis Wheatley and Paul Cuffey striving against the bars of prejudice, and Benjamin Banneker, the almanac maker, voiced their longings when he said to Thomas Jefferson, I freely and cheerfully acknowledge that I am of the African race, and in color, which is natural to them, of the deepest dye. And it is under a sense of the most profound gratitude to the supreme ruler of the universe that I now confess to you that I am not under that state of tyrannical thraldom and inhuman captivity to which too many of my brethren are doomed, but that I have abundantly tasted of the fruition of those blessings which proceed from that free and unequaled liberty with which you are favored, and which I hope you will willingly allow, you have mercifully received from the immediate hand of that being from whom proceedeth every good and perfect gift. 
everyone had such great vocabulary back in the day. Well, not everyone, but the, the intellectuals of society. Suffer me to recall to your mind that time in which the arms of the British crown were exerted with every powerful effort in order to reduce you to a state of servitude. Look back, I entreat you, on the variety of dangers to which you were exposed. Reflect on that period in which every human aid appeared unavailable, and in which even hope and fortitude wore the aspect of inability to the conflict. And you cannot but be led to a serious and grateful sense of your miraculous and providential preservation. You cannot but acknowledge that the present freedom and tranquility which you enjoy, you have mercifully received, and that a peculiar blessing of heaven. This, sir, was a time when you clearly saw into the injustice of a state of slavery, and in which you had just apprehensions of the horrors of its condition. It was then that your abhorrence thereof was so excited, that you publicly held forth this true and invaluable doctrine, which is worthy to be recorded and remembered in all succeeding ages. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm. We used to hear that in school all the time. Then came Dr. James Durham, who could tell even the learned Dr. Rush something of medicine, and Lemuel Haynes, to whom Middlebury College gave an honorary A.M. in 1804. These and others we may call the revolutionary group of distinguished Negroes. They were persons of marked ability, leaders of a talented tenth, standing conspicuously among the best of their time. They strove by word and deed to save the color line from becoming the line between the bond and free, but all they could do was nullified by Eli Whitney and the curse of gold. So they passed into forgetfulness. But their spirit did not wholly die. Here and there, in the early part of the century, came other exceptional men. Some were natural sons of unnatural fathers, and were given often a liberal training, and thus a race of educated mulattoes sprang up to plead for black men's rights. That's what we got now. There was <laughs> Ira Aldridge, whom all Europe loved to honor. Barack Obama. There was that voice crying in the wilderness, David Walker, Ka and saying, Colin Kaepernick. I declare it does appear to me as though some nations think God is asleep or that he made the Africans for nothing else but to dig their mines and work their farms. Or they cannot believe history, sacred or profane. I ask every man who has a heart, and is blessed with the privilege of believing, is not God a God of justice to all his creatures? Do you say he is? Then if he gives peace and tranquility to tyrants, and permits them to keep our fathers, our mothers, ourselves, and our children, in eternal ignorance and wretchedness to support them and their families, would he be to us a God of justice? I ask, O ye Christians, who hold us and our children in the most abject ignorance and degradation that ever a people were afflicted with since the world began, I say, if God gives you peace and tranquility, and suffers you thus to go on afflicting us, and our children, who have never given you the least provocation, would he be to us a God of justice? If you will allow that we are men who feel for each other, does not the blood of our fathers and of us, their children, cry aloud to the Lord of Sabbath against you for the cruelties and murders with which you have and do continue to afflict us? This was the wild voice that first aroused Southern legislators in 1829. Isn't it? crazy how different W.E.B. Du Bois views the slavery in the South versus Booker T. Washington, a man who was actually a slave. And that's what we have in society. How the masses view the inner city, the violence, the crime, the poverty, it's such a, it's such a falsehood. It's something you see on TV and you see propaganda, so you assume that's what it's really like to live in those environments. But as someone who grew up in those areas, it's, it's nothing like what's portrayed in the rap music or through media or movies and all that. ...to the terrors of abolitionism. In 1831, there met that first Negro convention in Philadelphia, at which the world gaped curiously, but which bravely attacked the problems of race and slavery, crying out against the persecution and declaring that laws as cruel in themselves as they were unconstitutional and unjust 
have in many places been enacted against our poor, unfriended, and unoffending brethren, without a shadow of provocation on our part, at whose bare recital the very savage draws himself up for fear of contagion, looks noble, and prides himself because he bears not the name of Christian. Side by side, this free Negro movement and the movement of abolition strove until they merged into one strong stream. Too little notice has been taken of the work which the talented tenth among Negroes took in the great abolition crusade. From the very day that a Philadelphia colored man became the first subscriber to Garrison's Liberator, to the day when Negro soldiers made the Emancipation Proclamation possible, black leaders worked shoulder to shoulder with white men in a move. Hey, if you was to listen to the news or anything mainstream in 2020, you would think black people ain't ever did anything but been slaves and been oppressed. But listen to individuals who really were alive during those times. It seems like there's a lot to be proud of, a lot to walk around with your head high and know that there are no limits in life outside the limits you set on yourself because you come from a line of men who have been fighting and achieving great things forever. Movement, the success of which would have been impossible without them. There was Purvis and Remond, Pennington and Highland Garnett, Sojourner Truth and Alexander Crummel, and above all, Frederick Douglass. My God. What would the abolition movement have been without them? They stood as living examples of the possibilities of the Negro. We need to look up the rest of those people, because I've heard of Sojourner Truth, and I've heard of Frederick Double Douglass, but the other abolitionists that he mentioned, I had never heard their names before reading this book. So I'll, I'll go back, I'll grab their names and put them in, a, in the description below, and we'll see if we can get some information about them out to the world. Grow race. Their own hard experiences and well-wrought culture said silently more than all the drawn periods of orators. They were the men who made American slavery impossible. As Maria Weston Chapman once said from the School of Anti-Slavery Agitation, a throng of authors, editors, lawyers, orators, and accomplished gentlemen of color have taken their degree. It has equally implanted hopes and aspirations noble thoughts and sublime purposes in the hearts of both races. It has prepared the white man for the freedom of the black man, and it has made the black man scorn the thought of enslavement, as does a white man, as far as its influence has extended. Strengthen that noble influence. Before its organization, the country only saw here and there in slavery some faithful Cujo or Dinah, whose strong natures blossomed even in bondage like a fine plant beneath a heavy stone. Now, under the elevating and cherishing influence of the American Anti-Slavery Society, the colored race, like the white, furnishes Corinthian capitals for the noblest temples. Where were these black abolitionists trained? Some, like Frederick Douglass, were self-trained, but yet trained liberally. Others, like Alexander Crummel and McCune Smith, graduated from famous foreign universities. Most of them rose up through the colored schools of New York and Philadelphia and Boston, taught by college-bred men like Russworm of Dartmouth and college-bred white men like Neu and Benezet. After emancipation came a new group of educated and gifted leaders, Langston, Bruce and Elliot, Greener, Williams and Payne, through. If you guys have heard of any of these individuals before, let me know in the comments who they are and what their contributions to society are. Political organization, historical and polemic writing and moral regeneration, these men strove to uplift their people. It is the fashion of today to sneer at them and to say that with freedom, Negro leadership should have begun at the plow and not in the Senate. A foolish and mischievous lie. Two hundred and fifty years that black serf toiled at the plow, and yet that toiling was in vain till the Senate passed the war amendments. And two hundred and fifty years more the half-free serf of today may toil at his plow. But unless he have political rights and righteously guarded civic status, he will still remain the poverty-stricken and ignorant plaything of rascals that he now is. Mm. This all sane <laughs> men know, Man, even here. if they dare not say it. And so we come to the present, a day of cowardice and vacillation, of strident, wide-voiced wrong and faint-hearted compromise, of double-faced dallying with truth and right. 
who are today guiding the work of the Negro people. The exceptions, of course, and yet, so sure as this talented tenth is pointed out, the blind worshippers of the average cry out in alarm. These are exceptions. Look here at death, disease, and crime. These are the happy rule. Of course they are the rule, because a silly nation made them the rule, because for three long centuries this people lynched Negroes who dared to be brave, raped black women who dared to be virtuous, crushed dark-hued youth who dared to be ambitious, and encouraged and made to flourish servility and lewdness and apathy. But not even this was able to crush all manhood and chastity and aspiration from black folk. A saving remnant continually survives and persists, continually aspires, continually shows itself in thrift and ability and character. Exceptional, it is to be sure, but this is the chiefest promise. It shows the capability of Negro blood, the promise of black men. Do Americans ever stop to reflect that there are in this land a million men of Negro blood, well-educated, owners of homes? against the honor of whose womanhood no breath was ever raised, whose men occupy positions of trust and usefulness, and who, judged by any standard, have reached the full measure of the best type of modern European culture. Is it fair? Is it decent? Is it Christian to ignore these facts of the Negro problem, to belittle such aspiration, to nullify such leadership? and seek to crush these people back into the mass out of which by toil and travail they and their fathers have raised themselves. Can the masses of the Negro people be in any possible way more quickly raised than by the effort and example of this aristocracy of talent and character? Was there ever a nation on God's fair earth civilized from the bottom upward? Never. It is, ever was, and ever will be, from the top downward that culture filters. That's the problem. The talented tenth rises and pulls all that are worth the saving up to their vantage ground. This is the history of human progress. And the two his... That's exa exactly what Kanye is saying at this current moment, is that the stars and the bright ones get picked up and pulled out, and everybody else gets there left to suffer and die. Uh, Booker T. Washington was a firm believer that... to become better in life you needed labor you needed skill you need to use your hands use your brain w.e.b. Du Bois felt that political power was the best way to advance society y'all can let me know in the comments if y'all rocking with Booker or w.e.b. but from what I see in society it seems like Booker T. Washington knew that taking care of yourself was was the best outcome for any situation never depend on the government never depend on someone else to to help you out because they're going to take advantage of you that's human nature historic mistakes which have hindered that progress were the thinking first that no more could ever rise save the few already risen or second that it would better the unrisen to pull the risen down how then shall the leaders of a struggling people be trained and the hands of the risen few strengthened there can be but one answer the best and most capable of their youth must be schooled in the colleges and universities of the land. We will not quarrel as to just what the University of the Negro should teach, or how it should teach it. I willingly admit that each soul and each race soul needs its own peculiar curriculum. But this is true. A university is a human invention for the transmission of knowledge and culture from generation to generation, through the training of quick minds. A university is a man-made invention to transfer of knowledge generation to generation right there if i'm sending my kids off to a university who, who's coming up with this curriculum in today's society because there's a lot of things being taught in a lot of colleges that are lowering the consciousness of humans i'm a big fan of educating yourself read books study but these schools unfortunately don't have the best interests at heart i can't say any more i don't know when it, it changed. But I just know if you spend your whole life going to school in Russia, you come out pro-Russia. If you spend your whole life going to school in China, you come out pro-China. But right now, you can go to the best elementary, the best middle school, the best high, school, best high school, and the best college in America, and you'll come out of all those things anti-American. And that's something that I don't understand, and maybe somebody in the comments can let me know how, why that is or how that is. Minds and pure hearts. And for this work, 
no other human invention will suffice, not even trade and industrial schools. All men cannot go to college, but some men must. Every isolated group or nation must have its yeast, must have for the talented few centers of training where men are not so mystified and befuddled by the hard and necessary toil of earning a living as to have no aims higher than their bellies and no god greater than gold this is true training and thus in the beginning were the favored sons of the freedmen trained out of the colleges of the north came after the blood of war ware cravath chase andrews bumstead and spence to build the foundations of knowledge and civilization in the black south where ought they to have begun to build at the bottom of course quibbles the mole with his eyes in the earth okay, up from Aye, truly at the bottom at the very bottom at the bottom of knowledge down in the very depths of knowledge there where the roots of justice strike into the lowest soil of truth and so they did begin they founded colleges and up from the colleges shot normal schools and out from the normal schools went teachers and around the normal teachers clustered other teachers to teach the public schools the college trained in greek latin and mathematics two thousand men and these men trained full fifty thousand others in morals and manners and they in turn taught thrift and the alphabet to nine millions of men who today hold three hundred million dollars of property it was a miracle the most wonderful peace battle of the nineteenth century and yet today men smile at it and in fine superiority tell us that it was all a strange mistake that a proper way to found a system of education is first to gather the children and buy them spelling books and hoes afterward men may look about for teachers if haply they may find them or again they would teach men work but as for life why what is work to do with life they ask vacantly was the work of these college founders successful did it stand the test of time did the college graduates with all their fine theories of life really live are they useful men helping to civilize and elevate their less fortunate fellows let us see omitting all institutions which have not actually graduated students from a college course there are today in the united states thirty four institutions giving something above high school training to negroes and designed especially for this race three of these were established in border states before the war thirteen were planted by the freedmen's bureau in the years eighteen sixty four to eighteen sixty nine nine were established between eighteen seventy and eighteen eighty by various church bodies five were established after eighteen eighty one by negro churches and four are state institutions supported by united states agricultural funds in most cases the college departments are small adjuncts to high and common school work as a matter of fact six institutions atlanta fisk howard shaw wilberforce and leland are the important negro colleges so far as actual work and number of students are concerned in all these institutions seven hundred and fifty negro college students are enrolled in grade the best of these colleges are about a year behind the smaller new england colleges and a typical curriculum is that of atlanta university here students from the grammar grades after a three years high school course take a college course of one hundred thirty six weeks one-fourth of this time is given to latin and greek one-fifth to english and modern languages one-sixth to history and imagine if we did that in today's society right uh, i got a story i want to share real quick so i listen to music in spanish so i can just enhance my brain strength the connections and i have my children listen to music with me in spanish sometimes too and i was playing frankie J. don't want to try anymore in spanish and right after that Hotel Lobby by Quavo and Takeoff came on. And my eight-year-old son said, Daddy, I didn't know they rap in Spanish. <laughs> Actually, my nine-year-old said that. But that just shows we have to enhance the children's vocabulary because if you have a kid and all he's ever heard is Migos and Chief Keef and Blueface, that he won't really have an intellectual vocabulary or a wide base of being able to articulate himself and 
language is extremely important. Grammar is extremely important. And there's a reason that Tupac said, pay attention to when the beat becomes more important than the lyrics because that's when you'll know the game is being played on you. And no one pays attention to the sound frequencies and the chakras in our body and how we're at 70 to 80 percent water and how that heavy bass affects the rhythm inside of us. But there are a lot of things that throw you off as a human being and you couple that with eating processed food and drinking water with fluoride in it and the the pollution in the air and, and holy moly man you are a complete zombie and you don't even know you're a zombie so drink spring water take vitamins fast from time to time and try to stay as connected with nature as you can and to be unplugged from this matrix from this video game of life social science one seventh to natural science one eighth to mathematics and one eighth to philosophy and pedagogy in addition to these students in the South, Negroes have attended Northern colleges for many years. As early as 1826, one was graduated from Bowdoin College, and from that time till today, nearly every year has seen elsewhere other such graduates. Why, doesn't, why don't the masses of us know that it was black Americans graduating from college in 1826? Why they just say we were just slaves? That was before the Emancipation Proclamation. There's a lot of mist in history that doesn't make sense. And that's why you got society walking around angry because they don't know themselves. They don't have a connection to who they really are. So I challenge you, man, to dig into these books and learn as much history as you can because the world is feeding you nothing but propaganda. They have, of course, met much color prejudice. Fifty years ago, very few colleges would admit them at all. Even today, no Negro has ever been admitted to Princeton and at some other leading institutions, they are rather endured than encouraged. Oberlin was the great pioneer in the work of blotting out the color line in colleges, and has more Negro graduates by far than any other northern college. The total number of Negro college graduates up to 1899, several of the graduates of that year not being reported, was as follows. Before 1876, Negro colleges 137, White Colleges, 75, 1875 to 80, Negro Colleges, 143, White Colleges, 22. So you mean to tell me in the, in the 1800s that it was the mat, a ton of black Americans graduated from college on a regular basis, year after year? <laughs> 1880 to 85, Negro Colleges, 250, White Colleges, 31. 1885 to 90, Negro Colleges 413, White Colleges 43, 1890 to 95, Negro Colleges 465, White Colleges 66, 1896 to 99, Negro Colleges 475, White Colleges 88, Class Unknown, Negro Colleges 57, White Colleges 64, Total, Negro Colleges 1914, White Colleges 390. Of these graduates, 2,079 were men and 252 were women. 50% of northern-born college men come south to work among the masses of their people at a sacrifice which few people realize. This don't make sense to the, the narrative that's been painted by the world of y'all ain't been nothing but oppressed and never been able to accomplish anything, never been able to do anything on your own. In the 1800s, you were graduated from college like this. Real knowledge, real history, the truth will set you free. There isn't my truth or your truth or her truth or his truth. It is just the truth. I challenge you to study history. Nearly 90% of the Southern-born graduates, instead of seeking that personal freedom and broader intellectual atmosphere which their training has led them, in some degree, to conceive, stay and labor and wait in the midst of their black neighbors and relatives. The most interesting question and in many respects the crucial question to be asked concerning college-bred Negroes is, do they earn a living? It has been intimated more than once that the higher training of Negroes has resulted in sending into the world of work men who could find nothing to do suitable to their talents. Now and then there comes a rumor of a colored college man working at menial service, etc. Fortunately, Returns as to occupations of college-bred Negroes gathered by the Atlanta Conference are quite full, nearly 60% of the total number of graduates. This enables us to reach fairly certain conclusions as to the occupations of all college-bred Negroes. 
Of 1,312 persons reported, there were teachers, 53.4%, clergymen, 16.8%, physicians, etc., 6.3%, students, 5.6%, lawyers, 4.7%, in government service, 4%, in business, 3.6%, farmers and artisans, 2.7%, Editors, secretaries, and clerks, 2.4%. Miscellaneous, 0.5%. Over half are teachers. A sixth are preachers. Another sixth are students and professional men. Over 6% are farmers, artisans, and merchants. And 4% are in government service. In detail, the occupations are as follows. Occupations of college-bred men. Teachers. Presidents and deans, 19. Teacher of music, 7. Professors, principals, and teachers, 675. Total, 701. Clergymen. Bishop, 1. Chaplains, U.S. Army, 2. Missionaries, 9. Presiding elders, 12. Preachers, 197. Total, 221. Physicians. Doctors of medicine, 76. Druggist, 4. Dentist, 3. Total, wow. 83. <laughs> Students, 74. Lawyers, 62. Civil Service, U.S. Minister Plenipotentiary, 1. U.S. Consul, 1. U.S. Deputy Collector, 1. U.S. Gauger, 1. U.S. Postmasters, 2. U.S. Clerk. And this is why we don't ever need to hear the first black this or the first black that, because if you look in history, everything has been done and done again and done again and done again but you're not supposed to have a connection to your forefathers so once again study so you can stop being misled by the propaganda of the world 44 state civil service 2 city civil service 1 total 53 businessmen merchants etc 30 managers 13 real estate dealers 4 total 47 farmers 26 Clerks and secretaries. Secretaries of national societies, 7. Clerks, etc., 15. Total, 22. Artisans, 9. Editors, 9. Miscellaneous, 5. These figures illustrate vividly the function of the college-bred Negro. He is, as he ought to be, the group leader, the man who sets the ideals of the community where he lives, directs its thoughts, and heads its social movements. It need hardly be argued that the Negro people need social leadership more than most groups, that they have no traditions to fall back upon, no long-established customs, no strong family ties, no well-defined social classes. All these things must be slowly and painfully evolved. The preacher was, even before the war, the group leader of the Negroes, and the church their greatest social institution. But we got to remember back at this time, the preachers was cozying up with Margaret Sanger, and they were sliding in with the NAACP. So it's been a, a lot of manipulation that's been going back from time. There's another book called Hammer and Hoe you can check out that talked about all the communist movements in the South of the 1910s, 20s, and 30s that were influencing the, the masses of black individuals. So it's always been an interesting break between, you could say, liberals, black liberals and black conservatives because Booker T. Washington, once again, who was an actual slave, said you got to start from slavery and go up. And W.E. Boyce feels like, no, the top is where you start and you work down. And I, I, I think that top-down method, unfortunately, is why we're in the situation we're in, because a few people feel like as long as they're doing good, then you never have to share the wisdom or share the wealth. And in order to accomplish anything, you have to plant the seeds, you have to water it, you have to give it sunlight and, and wait on the harvest to show. Naturally, this preacher was ignorant and often immoral. And the problem of replacing the older type by better educated men has been a difficult one. Both by direct work and by direct influence on other preachers and on congregations, the college-bred preacher has an opportunity for reformatory work and moral inspiration, the value of which cannot be overestimated. It has, however, been in the furnishing of teachers that the Negro College has found its peculiar function. Few persons realize how vast a work, how mighty a revolution has been thus accomplished. To furnish five millions and more of ignorant people with teachers of their own race and blood in one generation was not only a very difficult undertaking, but a very important one, 
in that it placed before the eyes of almost every Negro child an attainable ideal. It brought the masses of the blacks in contact with modern civilization, made black men the leaders of their communities and trainers of the new generation. In this work, college-bred Negroes were first teachers and then teachers of teachers. And here it is that the broad culture of college work has been of peculiar value. Knowledge of life and its wider meaning has been the point of the Negro's deepest ignorance, and the sending out of teachers whose training has not been simply for breadwinning, but also for human culture, has been of inestimable value in the training of these men. In earlier years, the two occupations of preacher and teacher were practically the only ones open to the black college graduate. Of later years, a larger diversity of life among his people has opened new avenues of employment. Nor have these college men been paupers and spendthrifts. 557 college-bred Negroes owned in 1899 $1,342,862.50 worth of real estate, assessed value, or $2,411 per family. The real value of the total accumulations of the whole group is perhaps about $10 million, or $5,000 apiece. Pitiful, is it not? Beside the fortunes of oil kings and steel trusts. But after all, is the fortune of the millionaire the only stamp of true and successful living? Alas, it is. With many. And there's the rub. The problem of training the Negro is today immensely complicated by the fact that the whole question of the efficiency and appropriateness of our present systems of education for any kind of child is a matter of active debate, in which final settlement seems still afar off. Consequently, it often happens that persons arguing for or against certain systems of education for Negroes have these controversies in mind and miss the real question at issue. The main question, so far as the Southern Negro is concerned, is what, under the present circumstance, must a system of education do in order to raise the Negro as quickly as possible in the scale of civilization? The answer to this question seems to me clear. It must strengthen the Negro's character, increase his knowledge, and teach him to earn a living. Now, it goes without saying that it is hard to do all these things simultaneously or suddenly, and that at the same time it will not do to give all the attention to one and neglect the others. We could give black boys trades, but that alone will not civilize a race of ex-slaves. We might simply increase their knowledge of the world, but this would not necessarily make them wish to use this knowledge honestly. We might seek to strengthen character and purpose, but to what end if this people have nothing to eat or to wear? A system of education is not one thing, nor does it have a single definite object, nor is it a mere matter of schools. Education is that whole system of human training within and without the schoolhouse walls, which molds and develops men. If then we start out to train an ignorant and unskilled people with a heritage of bad habits, our system of training must set before itself two great aims, the one dealing with knowledge and character, the other part seeking to give the child the technical knowledge necessary for him to earn a living under the present circumstances. These objects are accomplished in part by the opening of the common schools on the one and of the industrial schools on the other, but only in part, for there must also be trained those who are to teach these schools, men and women of knowledge and culture and technical skill who understand modern civilization and have the training and aptitude to impart it to the children under them. There must be teachers and teachers of teachers, and to attempt to establish any sort of a system of common and industrial school training without first, and I say first advisedly, without first providing for the higher training of the very best teachers, is simply throwing your money to the winds. Schoolhouses do not teach themselves. Piles of brick and mortar and machinery do not send out men. It is the trained, living human soul, cultivated and strengthened by long study and thought, that breathes the real breath of life into boys and girls, and makes them human, whether they be black or white, Greek, Russian, or American. Nothing in these latter days has so dampened the faith of thinking Negroes in recent educational movements, 
as the fact that such movements have been accompanied by ridicule and denouncement and decrying of those very institutions of higher training which made the negro public school possible and make the negro industrial schools thinkable it was fisk atlanta howard and Strait, those colleges born of the faith and sacrifice of the abolitionists that placed in the black schools of the south the thirty thousand teachers and more which some who depreciate the work of these higher schools are using to teach their own new experiments if hampton tuskegee and the hundred other industrial schools prove in the future to be as successful as they deserve to be then their success in training black artisans for the south will be due primarily to the white colleges of the north and the black colleges of the south which train the teachers who today conduct these institutions uh -huh. There was a time when the American people believed pretty devoutly that a log of wood with a boy at one end and Mark Hopkins at the other represented the highest ideal of human training. But in these eager days, it would seem that we have changed all that and think it necessary to add a... If the black teachers were from the North and educated from the North and then went down to the South, then they still have a disconnect on the way they view the world because just because we have the same skin color doesn't mean... We've had the same life experiences. If you grew up in Hawaii and I'm here in Kansas City, we're not going to look the same, think of life the same, no matter if we both black or not. And that's always been a downfall is that skin folk is kin folk. I could just put a black person on TV. I'm black, you black, we on the same side. I know when I was 18 years old, that's how I was manipulated into voting for Barack Obama. I didn't know anything about politics at all. I was just 18. I was old enough to vote. Lil Wayne and DJ Drama dropped a mixtape and said this could be the first black president, and that propaganda moved me. So I challenge everybody, move by intellect. Your brain is, is not worried about how much melanin you have inside your skin color versus mine. But you can think and grow, and you can ex expand the connections and, and the neurons in your brain and become an intellectual person that you never imagined you would be. That's with or without college. So we have to stop telling young men and young women that you aren't valuable if you don't go to college. You can get a trade. You can study James Allen, Booker T. Washington, Marcus Aureli, Marcus Garvey, and learn things that you never knew. You can study Dr. Joseph Murphy, Napoleon Hill, and you can influence the masses of society. I think the best people moving through this thing called life, and as well as the, the most successful and highly paid, are the ones that are self-taught, not spoon-fed through a university. A couple of sawmills and a hammer to this outfit and at a pinch to dispense with the services of mark hopkins i would not deny or for a moment seem to deny the paramount necessity of teaching the negro to work and to work steadily and skillfully or seem to depreciate in the slightest degree the important part industrial schools must play in the accomplishment of these ends but i do say and insist upon it that it is industrialism drunk with its vision of success to imagine that its own work can be accomplished without providing for the training of broadly cultured men and women to teach its own teachers and to teach the teachers of the public schools but i have already said that human education is not simply a matter of schools it is much more a matter of family and group life the training of one's home of one's daily companions of one's social class now the black boy of the south moves in a black world a world with its own leaders its own thoughts its own ideals in this world he gets by far the larger part of his life training and through the eyes of this dark world he peers into the veiled world beyond who guides and determines the education which he receives in his world his teachers here are the group leaders of the negro people the physicians and clergymen, the trained fathers and mothers, the influential and forceful men about him of all kinds. Here it is, if at all, that the culture of the surrounding world trickles through and is handed on by the graduates of the higher schools. Can such culture training of group leaders be neglected? Can we afford to ignore it? Do you think that if the leaders of thought among Negroes are not trained and educated thinkers, that they will have no leaders? On the contrary, a hundred half-trained demagogues will still hold the places they so largely occupy now, and hundreds of vociferous busybodies will multiply. You have no choice. 
either you must furnish this race from within its own ranks with thoughtful men of trained leadership or you must suffer the evil consequences of a headless misguided rabble Man. i am an earnest advocate of manual training and trade teaching for black boys and for white boys too i believe that next to the founding of negro colleges the most valuable addition to negro education since the war has been industrial training for black boys nevertheless i insist that the object of all true education is not to make men carpenters it is to make carpenters men there are two means of making the carpenter a man each equally important the first is to give the group and community in which he works liberally trained teachers and leaders to teach him and his family what life means the second is to give him sufficient intelligence and technical skill to make him an efficient workman the first object demands the negro college and college bred men not a quantity of such colleges but a few of excellent quality not too many college bred men but enough to leaven the lump to inspire the masses to raise the talented tenth to leadership the second object demands a good system of common schools well taught conveniently located and properly equipped the sixth atlantic conference truly said in 1901 we call the attention of the nation to the fact that less than one million of the three million negro children of school age are at present regularly attending school and these attend a session which lasts only a few months we are today deliberately rearing millions of our citizens in ignorance and at the same time limiting the rights of citizenship by educational qualifications this is unjust half the black youth of the land have no opportunities open to them for learning to read write and cipher in the discussion as to the proper training of negro children after they leave the public schools we have forgotten that they are not yet decently provided with public schools propositions are beginning to be made in the south to reduce the already meager school facilities of negroes we congratulate the south on resisting as much as it has this pressure and on the many millions it has spent on negro education but it is only fair to point out that negro taxes and the negroes share of the income from indirect taxes and endowments have fully repaid this expenditure so that the negro public school system has not in all probability cost the white taxpayers a single cent since the war this is not fair negro schools should be a public burden since they are a public benefit the negro has the right to demand good common school training at the hands of the states and the nation since by their fault he is not in position to pay for this himself what is the chief need for the building up of the negro public school in the south the negro race in the south needs teachers today above all else this is the concurrent testimony of all who know the situation for the supply of this great demand two things are needed institutions of higher education and money for schoolhouses and salaries it is usually assumed that a hundred or more institutions for negro training are today turning out so many teachers and college bred men that the race is threatened with an oversupply this is sheer nonsense there are today less than three thousand living negro college graduates in the united states and less than a thousand negroes in college moreover in the 164 schools for negroes 95 percent of their students are doing elementary and secondary work work which should be done in the public schools over half the remaining 2157 students are taking high school studies the mass of so-called normal schools for the negro are simply doing elementary common school work or at most high school work with a little instruction in methods the negro colleges and the postgraduate courses at other institutions are the only agencies for the broader and more careful training of teachers the work of these institutions is hampered for lack of funds it is getting increasingly difficult to get funds for training teachers in the best modern methods and yet all over the south from state superintendents county officials city boards and school principals comes the wail we need teachers and teachers must be trained 
as the fairest minded of all white southerners atticus g haygood once said the defects of colored teachers are so great as to create an urgent necessity for training better ones their excellencies and their successes are sufficient to justify the best hopes of success in the effort and to vindicate the judgment of those who make large investments of money and service to give to colored students opportunity for thoroughly preparing themselves for the work of teaching children of their people the truth of this has been strikingly shown in the marked improvement of white teachers in the south twenty years ago the rank and file of white public school teachers were not as good as the negro teachers but they by scholarships and good salaries have been encouraged to thorough normal and collegiate preparation while the negro teachers have been discouraged by starvation wages and the idea that any training will do for a black teacher really? if carpenters are needed it is well and good to train men as carpenters but to train men as carpenters and then set them to teaching is wasteful and criminal and to train men as teachers and then refuse them living wages unless they become carpenters is rank nonsense the united states commissioner of education says in his report for nineteen hundred for comparison between the white and colored enrollment in secondary and higher education i have added together the enrollment in high schools and secondary schools with the attendance on colleges and universities not being sure of the actual grade of work done in the colleges and universities the work done in the secondary schools is reported in such detail in this office that there can be no doubt of its grade he then makes the following comparisons of persons in every million enrolled in secondary and higher education 1880 whole country 4362 negroes 1289 1900 whole country 10743 negroes 2061 and he concludes while the number in colored high schools and colleges had increased somewhat faster than the population it had not kept pace with the average of the whole country for it had fallen from 30 percent to 24 percent of the average quota of all colored pupils one in 100 was engaged in secondary and higher work and that ratio has continued substantially for the past 20 years if the ratio of colored population in secondary and higher education is to be equal to the average for the whole country it must be increased to five times its present average and if this be true of the secondary and higher education it is safe to say that the negro has not one-tenth his quota in college studies how baseless therefore is the charge of too much training we need negro teachers for the negro common schools and we need first-class normal schools and colleges to train them this is the work of higher negro education and it must be done further than this after being provided with group leaders of civilization and a foundation of intelligence in the public schools the carpenter in order to be a man needs technical skill this calls for trade schools now trade schools are not nearly such simple things as people once thought trade schools the original idea was that the industrial school was it's wild that uh, this book was published in 1908 i keep saying that, and here we are in 2022 and young men need trades without a skill and being able to, to go out on your own and create some wealth and create some labor man you're going to be stuck in this world depending on someone else and that is not a position i, I think any young man black or white wants to be in was to furnish education practically free to those willing to work for it it was to do things i e become a center of productive industry it was to be partially if not wholly self-supporting and it was to teach trades admirable as were some of the ideas underlying this scheme the whole thing simply would not work in practice it was found that if you were to use time and material to teach trades thoroughly you could not at the same time keep the industries on a commercial basis and make them pay many schools started out to do this on a large scale and went into virtual bankruptcy moreover it was found also that it was possible to teach a boy a trade mechanically without giving him the full educative benefit of the process and vice versa that 
there was a distinctive educative value in teaching a boy to use his hands and eyes in carrying out certain physical processes, even though he did not actually learn a trade. It has happened, therefore, in the last decade that a noticeable change has come over the industrial schools. In the first place, the idea of commercially remunerative industry in a school is being pushed rapidly to the background. There are still schools with shops and farms that bring an income, and schools that use student labor partially for the erection of their buildings and the furnishing of equipment. It is coming to be seen, however, in the education of the Negro, as clearly as it has been seen in the education of the youths the world over, that it is the boy, and not the material product, that is the true object of education. Yes. Consequently, the object of the industrial school came to be the thorough training of boys, regardless of the cost of the training, so long as it was thoroughly well done. Even at this point, however, the difficulties were not surmounted. In the first place, modern industry has taken great strides since the war, and the teaching of trades is no longer a simple matter. Machinery and long processes of work have greatly changed the work of the carpenter, the iron worker, and the shoemaker. A really efficient workman must be today an intelligent man who has had good technical training in addition to thorough common school and perhaps even higher training. To meet this situation, the industrial schools began a further development. They established distinct trade schools for the thorough training of better-class artisans, and at the same time they sought to preserve, for the purposes of general education, such of the simpler processes of elementary trade learning as were best suited, therefore. In this differentiation of the trade school and manual training, the best of the industrial schools simply followed the plain trend of the present educational epoch. A prominent educator tells us that in Sweden, in the beginning the economic conception was generally adopted, and everywhere manual training was looked upon as a means of preparing the children of the common people to earn their living. But gradually it came to be recognized that manual training has a more elevated purpose, and one indeed more useful in the deeper meaning of the term. It came to be considered as an educative process for the complete moral, physical, and intellectual development of the child. Thus again, in the manning of trade schools and manual training schools, we are thrown back upon the higher training as its source and chief support. There was a time when any aged and worn-out carpenter could teach in a trade school, but not so today. Indeed, the demand for college-bred men by a school like Tuskegee ought to make Mr. Booker T. Washington the firmest friend of higher training. Here he has as helpers the son of a Negro senator, trained in Greek and the humanities, and graduated at Harvard, the son of a Negro congressman and lawyer, trained in Latin and mathematics, and graduated at Oberlin. He has as his wife... Understand it. He's saying we got sons of Negro congressmen and lawyers in the 1900s. This narrative of victimhood that has plagued the masses of individuals and is making so many people millions of dollars by running around talking about how oppressed they ancestors had it back in the day. They just selling you a false narrative. I challenge everyone to stop being emotionally manipulated. A woman who read Virgil and Homer in the same classroom with me. He has as college chaplain a classical graduate of Atlanta University, as teacher of science, a graduate of Fisk, as teacher of history, a graduate of Smith. Indeed, some 30 of his chief teachers are college graduates, and instead of studying French grammars in the midst of weeds or buying pianos for dirty cabins, they are at Mr. Washington's right hand, helping him in a noble work. And yet one of the effects of Mr. Washington's propaganda has been to throw doubt upon the expediency of such training for Negroes, as these persons have had. Men of America, the problem is plain before you. Here is a race transplanted through the criminal foolishness of your fathers. Whether you like it or not, the millions are here, and here they will remain. If you do not lift them up, they will pull you down. Education and work are the levers to uplift a people. 
work alone will not do it unless inspired by the right ideals and guided by intelligence education must not simply teach work it must teach life the talented tenth of the negro race must be made leaders of thought and missionaries of culture among their people no others can do this work and negro colleges must train men for it the negro race like all other races is going to be saved by its exceptional men end of section two recording by james k white chula vista now before we move forward with this I have a quote that I want to see if I can get on the screen. Because Booker T. Washington, a man who was actual a slave, said in order to advance in society, you had to do for self. You could not depend on somebody external. However, we just heard W.E.B. Du Bois with a total, threw a couple shots at Booker but also said that's not the way that civilization had worked. And so for me to step aside from either one of them real quick, there's another book that I really enjoy. It's called The Miseducation of the Negro. It's by Carter G. Woodson. And this is one of his quotes in that book. And I'm not sure if Carter G. was actual a slave. I got to look at a little more about him. But his quote aligns a little more with Booker T. Washington than with W.E.B. Du Bois. And what I've learned is most people who didn't grow up in hardship situations, they have the mindset that W.E.B. does, that we can, together we can lift the masses and we can change that hope and change narrative that you get from Obama and stuff like that, people who didn't really live in poverty. But when you really lived in poverty, you understand everybody has to help everybody so we can advance. When me and my brother was little and started paying bills, we was paying bills to help mom and daddy. It was, a, it was a family thing. We all lived in that same house. We all wanted to prosper. It wasn't about daddy was going to lift the whole family up by itself. His energy and his motivation could, but each one of us had to contribute. However, it says history shows that it does not matter who is in power or what revolutionary, for, revolutionary forces take over the government. Those who have not learned to do for themselves and have to solely depend on others, never obtain any more rights or privileges in the end than they had in the beginning. And here we are saying, government, daddy, fix this, government, fix this. If someone is externally taking care of you, you're a slave, consciously or unconsciously. And debt is servitude. So if someone is giving you something, they want something, a.k.a. the little stimulus checks that make sense while we have the inflation going. The way black Americans vote Democrat by the masses since 1932, that's because of little breadcrumbs that they have continually given you year after year. You can go watch the movie all the way about Lyndon Baines Johnson and how he wasn't really feeling the civil rights bill, but he told Martin Luther King, hey, y'all better take this. And then you could go listen to the bullet or the ballot speech by Malcolm X in 1964 when he says black Americans are political chumps. And you put Democrats first and they put you last. And you have to learn to do for yourself. No taxation without representation. And we're going to get into the rest of this book later on. Uh, we still got to check out Charles Chestnut, Wilfred Smith. But let me know in the comments what y'all think about the stark differences between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. And which one do you side with? Me being a man, I, I was never a slave at all. But I know what it's like to get it out the mud and to start at the very bottom. And I think it gives you a more well-rounded view of life it also makes you appreciate the small things but if i was born you know a rich kid the son of a doctor a son of a lawyer in a, in a big house with two three cars and got to go to the best schools my whole life i, I don't know how it could have related to the little man no matter how much i tried no matter how i heard his heart hardships and his stories i don't know if i really would have been able to sit shoulder to shoulder with him but like i can say coming from the bottom i can sit shoulder to shoulder with a homeless man i can sit shoulder to shoulder with a billionaire because we are just people but I had to be in those hardship situations to connect to humans. And I keep saying all we are is, is spirits encased in human flesh. And one day our bodies will drop and our spirit will expire on. And none of us know where we will go. But the art that you put out to the world lives forever. 
And I understand with these YouTube algorithms, I don't know how many people will ever get to check this video out or check this audio book out, but do not be manipulated by what you cannot do or cannot become simply because of your skin color. I understand right now that if I was putting out content talking about murdering other black people and disrespecting black women and, and all that and violating children, then I, then I know that the content would go far and wide, but it varies when you put out some, some enlightened, informational, uplifting, motivational stuff. So I hope everybody, you know, just read books, just study. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Ralph Waldo Trine. A Merry Christmas to you as well, my guy. Um, but I just want everybody to become the best version of themselves. Read, study, meditate, drink water, lift weights. If you can't lift 20 pounds, lift 10 pounds. If you can't do 10 push-ups, do one push-up. But do something to advance yourself in life because society wants you broke, on medication, lonely, and we all have the power individually not only to change our, our own situation but to change the people around us. You know, it doesn't take money to influence the world. It just takes a good heart and, some, and a good smile. And so I'm sending my love to everybody who happens to see this video. I'm, I'm, I hope you can put a smile on your face, go look in the mirror, and be proud of who you are. Think for yourself. Read for yourself. Abundance is yours. You are meant to have everything you want in this life. And until next time, we are out. We are out. We are out. Let me know in the comments what y'all think about the comparison between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. I'll check out the rest of the audio book. We'll maybe do this in a couple weeks. I like to randomly pop on live and show y'all that I'm a real human being. And I just want the world to advance. And I understand I can't do that alone. And I understand society wants us fighting over skin color. They want men versus women and, and all that low vibrational things. And I just see above that. And if we move in love, we move in a higher consciousness, we can step outside of the matrix and get society the way we want it to be. So everyone have a super mega awesome day. Enjoy. Y'all, thanks Christmas Eve and Christmas Day uh, and everything, man. We uh, we lit. Life is going to keep growing and growing. Abundance is mine. Abundance is yours. What I want for myself, I want for the world. Till next time, we out of All love.